Hey guys, in this week's podcast, I got Dr. Peter Osborne to drop by and talk about all things gluten. Now, this is a real interesting discussion we're going to have in today's show because so many people today are suffering from celiac disease, gluten intolerance, and we're going to find out today exactly what is going on and why is there such a rampant issue with gluten. Now, Dr. Peter Osborne is a clinical director of Town Center Wellness in Sugarland, Texas. He's a doctor of chiropractic medicine and a board-certified clinical nutritionist. You know what that means? He knows his stuff. He's an expert in orthomolecular and functional medicine. Ooh, what a coincidence. I like them both, <laughs> such as myself. And he has been practicing since 2001. His clinical focus is the holistic natural treatment of chronic degenerative diseases with a primary focus on gluten sensitivity and food allergies. He has helped thousands of patients recover from mysterious medical illnesses. I know you're going to have a blast listening to Dr. Osborne and I on today's podcast. Now, before we actually begin today's show, I just want to make sure if you had the opportunity to join the Optimal Nation by heading over to amirrosic.com. That's double E, not an I. You'll join thousands of people worldwide, all contributing together to share our knowledge expertise. By becoming an Inner Tribes member of the Optimal Nation, you're going to receive exclusive interviews, exclusive content delivered right to your inbox every single week. Now on with the show. It's time to talk health and nutrition. Are you ready to live a healthier lifestyle? Let's optimize your health. Welcome to The Optimal Show. Amir Rosick is a registered holistic nutritionist and a functional medicine practitioner. His life is dedicated toward the natural predilection of a healthy lifestyle. Stay tuned for excellent interviews with some of the most renowned medical professionals in the industry. From paleo to fitness to nutrition and psychology, this is one show you'll want to subscribe to. And now, let's welcome your host. Here's Amir Rosick. And welcome to another episode of the Optimal Health Show. We have the one and the only Dr. Peter Osborne on board. He's going to be talking to us about everything gluten, and this is a must-listen show. Now, before we actually begin the show, I just want you guys to sit down, relax, because this is going to be an instant classic. Dr. Peter, are you with us? I'm here. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, Dr. Osborne, for coming on board. I've been following you for quite some time right now, really looking at all the research that you're doing around gluten, and it's really in line with what I believe in. And I think people really need to understand that eliminating gluten and that there are true dangers among these types of foods. Now, obviously, you didn't just all of a sudden jump into this. Like, How did you actually get interested in the world of, uh, say, wheat and gluten? Well, that's a, that's a great question. I um, actually started out, I had a young patient with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and uh, we diagnosed him with gluten sensitivity. He was terminal. He only had six months to live. And the doctors had sent him home, told his mom to prepare for his death. And it was, it was actually very sad. It was heart-wrenching. And um, we diagnosed him with gluten sensitivity, but pizza was his favorite food, and his mom didn't want to take away his favorite food because she was worried that he was dying. So she wanted his last months to be, you know, to be to be memorable for him. Well, it took me a couple of months to, and I finally convinced her to take him gluten free, and and that was over ten years ago. And today he's a, he's in high school, he's in the band, he's off all medications, and uh, that was my first introduction to really the the great power that gluten can have about saving someone's life from autoimmune disease. And so that was my, my real first initial, I guess you could say, very, very powerful story uh, revolving around gluten. And from there, I just did more and more research and, and did more and more with my patients in my clinic. And uh, I just learned so much over the last 13 years of, of how diet change can really change the outcome of a person's illness. Definitely. And Let's just rewind a little bit in case some of my audience or listeners out there doesn't really know exactly what we're talking about. Can you just summarize it in your own words very quickly, like an abstract of, you know, what is gluten? Well, gluten is, although referred to oftentimes as a singular term, it's actually a family of proteins. There are thousands of different glutens, 
And what they are, they're the pro storage proteins found within grains, grains being defined as the seeds of grass. So there are a number of different species of grass, and there are a number of different types of glutens found within these grasses. We traditionally define gluten as a sequence of proteins found in wheat, barley, and rye because of the way celiac disease, which is a disease that is caused by gluten, was discovered. However, newer research is showing that prominently most glutens have a similar structure and so like glutens in corn and glutens in rice and sorghum, these are grains that are traditionally called gluten-free grains, actually do cause inflammatory damage. So to back up again, gluten is, is a family of proteins found within all grains. Interesting. And so what's happening these days? All of a sudden this research is coming out. What is gluten doing you know, to us in our bodies? Well, it does a number of things. One, it's a very, very digestive resistant protein. So it's very hard for humans to break it down. And because we are not breaking it down properly, um, it causes a change in the fermentation products in our, in our gut. Our bacteria are trying to break it down for us, and this creates side effects within the gut. Some of these side effects cause intestinal leakage or, or leaky gut syndrome. Some of these side effects alter the nature of the bacteria that live in our intestines and create a hyperinflammatory state. And some of these reactions are actually autoimmune reactions where our immune system doesn't like the gluten and therefore attacks it. Interesting. So basically, I've been also reading studies and looking at that. You just mentioned that a second ago that when you do digest gluten and it goes in your GI tract, that actually actually has a possibilities of causing uh, gut permeability. Do you know exactly the mechanism behind that? Like, how does gluten actually cause you to have holes within your, uh, you know, GI tract? Yeah. So this was discovered about nine years ago at the University of Maryland. Doctor Doctor Alessio Fasano discovered that gluten impacts a protein between the cell lining or between the walls of the cells called zonulin. And this protein is responsible for holding the cells together so that there's no gap in between them. Well, gluten dismantles um, these what are called tight junction proteins through an action on zonulin and it causes leaky gut. That, that's quite interesting. So basically, the more people consume gluten, the more, and if this zonulin activation is happening in their body, more and more they're actually creating holes within their GI tract, right? That's correct. Wow. So you mentioned something earlier before that not too many people actually know about this, but there's different variants of gluten known as gliadin, like alpha, beta, right? So if we can like really touch base on that, and if you can explain to our audience more that gluten isn't just gluten, there's different forms of gluten, correct? That's right, and this is what I was referring to a moment ago when I said there's thousands of different gluten-based proteins. Um, we traditionally, in, in, in 1952, a, a German researcher identified that grain was responsible for causing celiac disease, but it was done in Germany where the staple grains of Germany are wheat, barley, and rye. So a lot of the original research done around gluten was focusing on wheat, barley, rye, and oats. But what we've discovered, and actually the research isn't all that, that new, it's as, as old as the 1970s, is that uh, there are glutens in corn and there are glutens in sorghum, there are glutens in rice and other grains that, um, that can also create similar types of damage. And so what we see in research is that when people go on this traditional gluten-free diet, which is the wheat, barley, rye free, but they continue to buy all these other products, is, is about 92% of them fail to respond or continue to have problems, health issues related to autoimmunity. Mm, quite fascinating. Now, obviously, I like to use cognitive thinking and be rational at the same time. And if I look, for example, my grandmother, a great grand grandmother who did consume bread on a daily basis, and she didn't have too many symptoms as we do today. Is there any difference between when my grandmother ate bread and what we're eating today? Unfortunately, yes. And that's a big part of the, of the problem is that the, the breads and the, and the grains today are super gluten grains. They're about two times, in some cases, as many as three times higher in gluten content. So people are getting a greater exposure to gluten. But the other element in the U.S. is that we recommend this food guide pyramid. I should say, shouldn't say we recommend, but it's commonly recommended. The food guide pyramid's foundation is whole grain. And so people are told to eat eight to ten servings of whole grain a day. And we've genetically hybridized the whole grain to contain two to three times more gluten than what it originally contained. So people are just getting a much greater exposure to gluten and activating these gene sequences that re cause an inflammatory response.
The other element that, that a lot of scientists um, are, are kind of investigating and, and, and considering at this point is maybe it's not even just, just the gluten, that there are other chemicals and other aspects of the genetic hybridization of grain that is also leading to some of the digestion resistance and leading to some of the other inflammatory responses. So I think, it's, I think we could summarize it and say, yes, it's gluten, but it's more gluten today than it was 30 years ago. There's more recommendation of whole grain today than there was 30 years ago. There are other chemicals that we add to grain that synergize with gluten and make it, make it more potent. It didn't exist 30 years ago. So we have this conglomeration of things all happening at the same time. On top of that, we take the top three medications prescribed in the U.S. are antibiotics, pain medications, and gastrointestinal reflux-based drugs. And these, these drugs all affect the integrity of the GI tract. So you take the average American whose GI tract is in, is in ruins and you expose them to more gluten than they were ever supposed to be exposed to and you also expose them to other things that their gut can't process and digest and we see the manifestation of a widespread development of illness related to grain. I couldn't agree more. So what's your whole take then on gluten testing? Do you think that's valid or should just everyone say since we have this information no one should be even eating it in the first place? I think people need black and whites. I don't think you can you can say you need to go gluten free because I said so. Um, I prefer genetic testing, and the reason why antibody testing is non-specific. So if I test somebody for gluten sensitivity, what I'm really testing them for isn't gluten sensitivity. I'm testing them for IgG response to gliadin. Now gliadin is one type of of gluten protein out of thousands of different types of gluten proteins, and IgG is one type of antibody that the human body makes out of five different kinds of antibodies that the human body can make. And so you can see how much that could be confusing to get a negative test result doesn't mean negative. It could mean false negative. I like DNA testing because what DNA tells us, it tells us whether or not a person has a genetic pattern and whether or not their, their white blood cell receptors are going to look at gluten as primarily an enemy or as a, as a potential non-enemy. Interesting. And are you looking for the HLA DQ8 markers? I'm looking for multiple HLA markers. Uh, but yes, part of that is HLA DQ8 and part of that is HLA DQ2. Fascinating. So if someone does have these markers, is that does that correlate it's being expressed right away? Because I'm familiar with, uh, for example, say if I run a 23andMe SNP panel and it comes back with those markers. Now, does that guarantee that that person ha is uh, prone to become very gluten sensitive, or is there do you have to look at signs and symptoms on intake form? Both. Um, the way that's the way I make the call clinically is is the presence of DNA markers in combination with the presence of of clinical symptoms. Mm, I couldn't agree anymore. So now we know that you know the the wheat is transmutogenic. It's been altered, you know, since our grandmothers have eaten it. We're eating more of it. Our bodies are becoming sicker. We're having genetic markers that we can actually identify people who are more prone to the gluten, such as the HLA DQ8 markers. Now the question remains is, uh, what studies are out there, like strong scientific studies linking uh, when you take away gluten that your symptoms improve? You mentioned there was a you know, lady at your practice that got you interested in, and once you remove gluten, her health changed around. So I've heard that uh, arthritis, osteoporosis, and many other certain uh, quote unquote out diseases actually can be alleviated when you remove gluten, right? Well, there are over 190 different medical disease conditions, syndromes, symptoms that can be alleviated with a gluten-free diet. Now, an important point to make is we don't want to blame gluten for everything, right? I mean, these diseases existed before we, we did all these bad things to grain. And so it's not just gluten. Gluten can exacerbate many conditions, and gluten can cause many conditions. And there are thousands of research studies, double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trials, which is what most doctors consider to be the fundamental uh, evidence or proof in science. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that 100%, but, but that's, that's what the standard is today. There are thousands of studies that show elimination of gluten resolving migraine headaches and neuropathy and epileptic seizure-based disorders and IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, both, both types of IBS, as well as ulcerative colitis and Crohn's and rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and Sjogren's and dermatomyositis and hypothyroidism. So we have this very, very long list 
of research studies, this very, very long list, and it's not all anecdotal, and that's, you know, what a lot of doctors, because they don't really read literature outside of what drug reps bring to them, they, 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 they make the claim that there's no research on gluten causing disease, when in, in fact, if you go to PubMed.com, which is a website anyone can access, um, you can type in gluten-related diseases, and you are going to pull back more evidence and more research than you'll ever know what to do with. Fascinating. I couldn't agree more. And you just touched on something that I've had uh, quite a bit of experience with in my practice, dealing with people who have thyroid issues and arthritis. Can you explain to our audience in your practice, what connection have you seen the gluten and arthritis connection? So there are a number of connections. Um, a lot of patients I see with rheumatoid arthritis respond very, very well to elimination of gluten. There's actually a number of research studies that show this as well. When I was in the, I was actually studied in the VA hospital in the rheumatology department. It's where I, where I initially got my start in, into autoimmunity and gluten. And um, there were only really a few known factors that we could take our patients in the hospital and actually get them better. And the, and, the, and the most the one that stood out to me the most was taking food away. If you would fast these patients, their symptoms would go away, which obviously when you fast somebody, that makes you think, okay, if you're an analytical thinker, fasting them and they get better means probably something in their diet is responsible for promoting the inflammation. Well, gluten can promote inflammation by creating something called molecular mimicry. So what happens is the gluten protein itself that our own immune system will start to attack can resemble the cartilage tissue within the joints. And so as the immune system is attacking the gluten, it starts looking at the cartilage and says, hey, this is also a bad guy. And it starts actually disrupting cartilage production and causing inflammation. But we also see that grain is very high in omega-6 fatty acids and alters the fatty acid ratio within the body and makes it more pro-inflammatory. And so this can take and cause a heightened pain response in many patients and make them susceptible to the development of, of uh, chronic degenerative arthritis and disc damage and, and cartilage damage. Um, so there are a number of elements and there's also the pesticides. We know many of the pesticides can induce autoimmunity within the joints as well. So there's a number of factors that play a role uh, that we see with grains and arthritis. Interesting. Very interesting. And I could not agree anymore. And right now there's such a prevalent push for this, you know, keep on eating wheat, whole wheat, and they're like really going against our thinking. And a lot of people find it hard to accept the reality that, for example, their so-called whole wheat bread is not healthy for them anymore. What have you seen? Why do you think is why do you think this exists right now? Why is there such a paradigm? And it's really hard to accept that for maybe whole wheat bread isn't healthy for you. Because the government has forced the message down our throats for the last 30 years. And, you know, there's a, there's a fundamental truth that is also a fundamental lie. And that is the more times you tell a lie, the more it becomes the truth. And so when we have a, a food guide pyramid in our children's schools that they're being exposed to from very early ages, and we have, parent, we have families where both parents work, and so neither parent is really home teaching the children about the quality of food and where food comes from and the health of food and the... And, and, and what it's all about, we, we lose sight of where nutrition and its importance really is. So I think that's part of the problem. But then I think one of the biggest problems that we have is that grain and the growth of grain is subsidized by U.S. taxpayer dollars. And so you have a lot of these farmers producing these crops to feed 300 plus million people. And so it's become something we've depended on to feed so many people and prevent starvation. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. I think we can move away from that double-edged sword. We just have to come up with an intuitive and, and, and creative solutions to not make grain the staple in the diet, but to make other foods the staple in the diet. I couldn't agree more. And I just want to jump quickly back to something you quickly touched on because I just wrote an article about that. And this is really important for people to really know and understand that when you do eat gluten, it's very similar protein for other types of foods such as dairy. So Dr. Osborne was mentioning cross reactivity. So Dr. Osborne, can you just please little, expand a little bit more for our audience and explain to them in depth exactly how cross reactivity or molecular mimicry really works? Sure. So, you know, think of it like this. If, if you think about a car, you're being very generic and you're saying, okay, the car. And if you imagine a car in your mind, you're imagining this metal structure with four wheels and a motor. 
but there are multiple varieties of cars, right? We've got Honda, Toyota, Ford, etc., and we've got different colors and shapes and, and, and etc., but they're all basically very similar. Well, think of gluten much like this, and think of gluten as a family of proteins that all have very great similarities, but then there are other proteins in other foods and things that we consume that also may be similar in shape to gluten proteins as well. These proteins that we've already been reacting to for gluten, they prime the immune system to react. And so when the immune system sees other foods that are similar, it could also potentially react to those. Those are That's cross-reactivity of foods. But then we have another process whereby the protein structures within our own bodily tissues, for example, the protein structure in our joints, our cartilage, the protein structure in our thyroid gland, protein structures in our skin or our kidney or our liver, can also look like these proteins that the body has been attacking. Mm. It varies from person to person. So molecular mimicry is really the process whereby the immune system is so used to attacking a particular food that it starts to attack the body where that body tissue might also look like that food or have a similar shape or structure. Yeah, exactly. I, that's a really good, simple explanation that I think the audience can really picture in their mind right now. So basically, the more gluten people are eating, it's going to react quite easily to other proteins in that person's body. Now, I wanted to touch base quickly back on the whole thyroid thing in gluten. What have you seen in your practice that connects gluten with thyroid? Well, I've seen gluten cause Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune version of thyroid disease, and I've seen gluten cause malnutrition or, or vitamin mineral deficiency that can cause different kinds of thyroid, low thyroid levels. For example, uh, whereas Hashimoto's disease would fall under more of that molecular mimicry autoimmune disease category, a person can develop hypothyroidism because of a vitamin D deficiency or a selenium deficiency or an iodine deficiency or a vitamin A deficiency. So there's certain nutrients that the body needs. Think of vitamins and minerals the same way. I'm going to give you another analogy. If we're building a house and all the contractors show up to, to build the house, but we're out of roof shingles and we're out of two by fours and we're out of nails, right? Think of the nails and the shingles and the two by fours as vitamin B and vitamin D and vitamin C. Well, if you don't have the right tools to build the house, the, you're going to build a house that's less protective, that's less effective. And the same thing happens internally in the body. When we're trying to make thyroid hormone, we require certain vitamins, minerals, nutrients, and chemical reactions to occur. And if we're, if we're deficient in those nutrients as a result of malabsorption, then what's going to happen is we're going to develop a disease associated with that nutritional loss. I agree. I agree 100%. And now when we're looking at the science behind glycogen and gluten and what it does in the body, is it fair to say that in in any case, like let's say you do run a genetic profile and you do a proper intake form, that when a person does eliminate, say, wheat or gluten from their body, you generally, no matter what your health condition is, you see a slight improvement? Okay, repeat that question. So say, generally speaking, someone that's like asymptomatic, meaning maybe they're not, he or she is not showing any signs, but maybe does have some health issues. And once that person does eliminate gluten, have you seen that those people naturally tend to get better? Yeah, because health is relative, right? When a person says they don't have any problems, it's relative to what they're used to in life. I've seen patients that told me they weren't sick, but they were 75 pounds overweight and <laughs> walk a mile. So, I mean, when I say health is relative, I mean, health is, it's good to have a good mindset and a positive mindset. But it's misleading to yourself to have a positive mindset in the in the presence of obvious problems. And so you'll have some people who have obvious problems, but they dismiss these obvious problems uh, and, and minimize them or diminish them in their own minds so that they don't have to think about them. Hundred mm, percent makes sense. Oh, it makes perfect sense. Now I get this question asked to me every single day from many people on my email. I probably get like fifty emails a day. Amir, what's your take on rice and what's your take on Quinoa. Now, Dr. Osborne, I know you've done some studies and research about this. Can you, can you, in your own words, explain to our audience, you know, if you do have gluten intolerance, you can't handle gluten, is, are these two food groups really safe for you? No, they're not. Um, 
rice has a form of gluten in it. As a matter of fact, the Great Wall of China, the mortar in the Great Wall of China is rice gluten. Mm. It's the oldest standing structure. How well do you think your body's going to digest it? <laughs> and, and especially the genetically modified version with cadmium and, and other pesticides and toxins in it. Uh, but no, there are some studies that show that, that uh, rice actually causes enterocolitis or inflammation of the GI tract. Now, of course, there's no, def there's no 100 percent definitive study, but I, I like to err to the side of caution. I, I would rather see my patient get better and avoid these things than, than, than hang on to remnants of illness or end up creating a, a greater problem down the road. Uh, as far as quinoa is concerned, a new study just came out on quinoa, I think it was February of this year, where uh, quinoa was a certain gluten or gluten like protein in quinoa was isolated and found to cause damage in those with gluten sensitivity. So, again, I, I tend to say if you've got a gluten problem, why, are you, why do you want to play with fire? I mean, the whole point of, of, of avoidance is not for fun, it's for health, right? And if we have a health issue, we want to take it more seriously than just the casual dismissal of a few foods. I agree 100%. And that leads me to my next question, and I'm, pr I'm pretty sure it's going to be the same answer, is most people say, well, what happens if I sprout or if I ferment my bread? Is that okay? Not if you're gluten sensitive. Um, sprouting does not necessarily eliminate gluten, and actually sprouting can create um, a larger quantity in wheat especially of something called wheat germaglutinin, which is a very toxic substance. Uh, which is, is known to create a number of problems, including arthritis. Um, so, no, I would say sprouting, if you read, there's some traditional cookbooks and some traditional methodologies where people prepare foods that are, that are in, in, in an uncooked or unprocessed form toxic to the human body. And, and, and my philosophy is very simple. Why would you take a food that's relatively toxic to the human body and, and alter it in a different way so that it's non-toxic when there are plenty of other options to choose from. <laughs> I agree 100%. Totally agree with that. And it's, I think it goes back to like a psychological thing. It's kind of tough for people at the beginning to give up everything because we were, like you mentioned earlier, we were programmed to believe the you know, whole wheat is healthy, that you know, eating copious amounts of rice is healthy. And now I think it's just a huge gimmick right now, the whole ploy of quinoa. Everywhere you see it's organic quinoa. And he's just mentioned there is glided in. In, in quinoa so it's really a tough psychological battle would you say that's that's pretty true I think so I think we're dealing with media I think we're dealing with people trying to sell us stuff every day you know uh, I think we're dealing with misinformation I think a lot of people that go into the gluten-free food market do so with good intention um, but produce products that are less than healthy and uh, and to me that the whole point of, 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 of that whole industry was was originally designed to establish things that people could eat that should be healthy for them and not necessarily substitute products that are equally unhealthy in different ways mm, totally so if you have to then summarize right now what would be your number one optimal health tip that you would give somebody in order for them to achieve optimal health well in one in one thing I, I would say there's not one thing I would say there's three things that probably a person could do and make and, and do the most good or most benefit and one is the elimination of processed food altogether mm -hmm. uh, two would be to get involved in some type of functional exercise program whether you do it at home or whether you do it in group training sessions but functional exercise is a kind of exercise I'm sure you're aware that that uh, it mimics normal body movements not two-dimensional weight machines but 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 something that's going to challenge you it's going to challenge your muscles and allow your muscles to grow and allow your body fluid movement and solid movement. Movement is a, is a crucial element that's missing. And I would say the third thing that I would say, uh, say a person or people need to do, especially in America, is, is take periodic time off of work. Take a vacation. Uh, get connected with the earth. Get connected with your family. Get connected with the things in life that are very important. I couldn't agree more. Those are some excellent tips you just gave our audience. And... I want everyone to really just pause for a second and take in the information you just learned that Dr. Osborne has provided with us because it's going to truly benefit you and your family. Dr. Osborne, I want to thank you so much for coming on the Optum Health Show and educating our audience about the real truth about gluten. You're very welcome, Amir. I appreciate you having me on. I'm always willing to share information. Thank you, Dr. Osborne. You have yourself an amazing day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.
Hey guys, I really hope you enjoyed today's episode with Dr. Peter Osborne, and I really hope you enjoyed the information we presented. Now you know the real truth behind gluten, and take this information, utilize it, and benefit your family. Now, if you're interested in more information about gluten, head over to the Gluten Free Society, and from here you'll have so much more resources. This is Dr. Peter Osborne's personal site, educating doctors and patients about gluten sensitivity. <laughs> I'm telling you, you can spend here months and months of just researching the articles over here. I highly suggest you go check it out. So once again, that's glutenfreesociety.org. I wish you guys all an amazing week. I will see you soon and keep on rocking.